In a little district west of Washington Square, the streets have run crazy and broken themselves into small strips called places. These places make strange angles and curves. One street crosses itself a time or two. An artist once discovered a valuable possibility in this street. Suppose a collector with a bill for paints, paper and canvas should, in traversing this route, suddenly meet himself coming back without a cent having been paid on account. So to quaint old Greenwich Village, the art people soon came prowling, hunting for north windows and 18th century gables and Dutch attics and low rents. Then they imported some pewter mugs and a chaffing dish or two from 6th Avenue and became a colony. At the top of a squatty three-story brick, Sue and John C. had their studio. John C. was familiar for Joanna, one was from Maine, the other from California. They had met at the table DOT of an 8th Street Delmonico's and found their tastes in art, chicory salad and bishop sleeves so congenial that the studio resulted. That was in May. In November, a cold unseen stranger whom the doctors called pneumonia stalked about the colony, touching one here and there with his icy fingers. Over on the east side, this ravager strode boldly, smiting his victims by scores. But his feet trod slowly through the maze of the narrow and moss-grown places. Mr. Pneumonia was not what you would call a chivalric old gentleman. A knight of a little woman with blood thinned by Californian zephyrs was hardly fair game for the red-fisted, short-breathed old duffer. But John C. he smote, and she lay scarcely moving on her painted iron bedstead, looking through the small Dutch window panes at the blank side of the next brick house. One morning, the busy doctor invited Sue into the hallway with a shaggy grey eyebrow. She has one chance in, let us say, ten, he said as he shook down the mercury in his clinical thermometer. And that chance is for her to want to leave. This way people have of lining up on the side of the undertaker makes the entire pharmacopoeia look silly. Your little lady has made up her mind that she's not going to get well. Has she anything on her mind? She... She wanted to paint the Bay of Naples some day, said Sue. Paint? Bosh! Has she anything on her mind worth thinking about twice? A man, for instance? A man, said Sue with a Jew's harp twang in her voice, is a man worth? But no, doctor, there is nothing of the kind. Well, it is the weakness then, said the doctor. I will do all that science so far as it may filter through my efforts can accomplish. But whenever my patient begins to count the carriages in her funeral procession, I subtract 50% from the curative power of medicines. If you will get her to ask one question about the new winter styles in cloak sleeves, I will promise you a 1 in 5 chance for her instead of 10. After the doctor had gone, Sue went into the workroom and cried a Japanese napkin to a pulp. Then she swaggered into Johnsy's room with her drawing board, whistling ragtime. Johnsy lay scarcely making a ripple under the bedclothes with her face toward the window. Sue stopped whistling, thinking she was asleep. She arranged her board and began a pen and ink drawing to illustrate a magazine story. Young artists must pave their way to art by drawing pictures for magazine stories that young authors write to pave their way to literature. As Sue was sketching a pair of elegant horseshoe riding trousers, a monocle on the figure of the hero, an Idaho cowboy, she heard a low sound several times repeated. She went quickly to the bedside. Johnsy's eyes were open wide. She was looking out the window and counting, counting backward. Twelve, she said, and a little later, eleven, and then ten, and nine, and then eight, and seven, almost together. Sue looked solicitously out the window. What was there to count? 
there is only a bare dreary yard to be seen and the blank side of the brick house twenty feet away. An old, old ivy vine gnarled and decayed at the roots climbed halfway up the brick wall. The cold breath of autumn had stricken its leaves from the vine until its skeleton branches clung, almost bare to the crumbling bricks. What is it, dear? Tell your Sudi. Leaves on the ivy vine. When the last one falls, I must go too. I have known that for three days. Didn't the doctor tell you? Oh, I never heard of such nonsense, complained Sue with magnificent scorn. What have old ivy leaves to do with your getting well? And you used to love that vine, so you naughty girl? Don't be a goosey. Why, the doctor told me this morning that your chances for getting well real soon were, let's see exactly what he said. He said the chances were 10 to 1. Why, that's almost as good a chance as we have in New York when we ride on the streetcars or walk past a new building. Try to take some broth now and let Sudi go back to her drawing so she can sell the editor man with it and buy port wine for her sick child and pork chops for her greedy self. You needn't get any more wine, said Johnsy, keeping her eyes fixed on the window. There goes another. No, I don't want any broth. That leaves just four. I want to see the last one fall before it gets dark. Then I'll go too. Johnsy dear, said Sue, bending over her, will you promise to keep your eyes closed and not look out the window until I'm done working? I must hang those drawings in by tomorrow. I need the light or I could draw the shed down. Couldn't you draw in the other room? asked Johnsy coldly. I'd rather be here by you, said Sue. Besides, I don't want you to keep looking at those silly ivy leaves. Tell me as soon as you have finished, said John C., closing her eyes and lying white and still as a fallen statue. Because I want to see the last one fall. I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of thinking. I want to turn loose my hold on everything and go sailing down, down, just like one of those poor leaves. Try to sleep, said Sue. I must call Berman up to be my model for the old hermit miner. I'll not be gone a minute. Don't try to move till I come back. Old Berman was a painter who lived on the ground floor beneath them. He was past 60 and had a Michelangelo's Moses beard curling down from the head of a satyr along the body of an imp. Berman was a failure in art. Forty years he had wielded the brush without getting near enough to touch the hem of his mistress's robe. He had been always about to paint a masterpiece, but had never yet begun it. For several years he had painted nothing, except now and then a daub in the line of commerce or advertising. He earned a little by serving as a model to those young artists in the colony who could not pay the price of a professional. He drank gin to excess and still talked of his coming masterpiece. For the rest, he was a fierce little old man who scoffed terribly at the softness in anyone and who regarded himself as special mastiff in waiting to protect the two young artists in the studio above. Sue found Berman smelling strongly of juniper berries in his dimly lighted den below. In one corner was a blank canvas on an easel that had been waiting there for 25 years to receive the first line of the masterpiece. She told him of Jeanne's fancy and how she feared she would, indeed light and fragile as a leaf herself, float away when her slight hold upon the world grew weaker. Old Berman, with his red eyes plainly streaming, shouted his contempt and derision for such idiotic imaginings. Vas, he cried, is there people in the world need their foolishness to die because leaves they drop off from confounded vine? I have not heard of such a thing. No, I will not pose as a model for you, fool hermit dunderhead. Why do you allow that silly pussiness to come in the brain of her? Ach, that poor little Miss Johnsy. She is very ill and weak, said Sue, and the fever has left her mind morbid and full of strange fancies. 
Very well, Mr. Berman, if you do not care to pose for me, you needn't. But I think you are a horrid old, old flibberty gibbet. You are just like a woman, yelled Berman. Who said I will not pose? Go on, I come meet you. For half an hour, I have been trying to say that I am ready to pose. But this is not any place in which one so good as Miss Yancey shall lie sick. Some day I will paint a masterpiece and we shall all go away. God, yes. Yancey was sleeping when they went upstairs. She pulled the shade down to the window seal and motioned Berman into the other room. In there they peered out the window fearfully at the ivy vine. Then they looked at each other for a moment without speaking. A persistent cold rain was falling mingled with snow. Berman in his old blue shirt took his seat as the hermit miner on an upturned kettle for a rock. When Sue awoke from an hour's sleep the next morning, she found John C. with dull, wide-open eyes staring at the drawn green shed. Pull it up, I want to see, she ordered in a whisper. Wearily Sue obeyed. But lo, after the beating rain and fierce gusts of wind that had endured through the leave-long night, there yet stood out against the brick wall one ivy leaf. It was the last on the vine, still dark green near its stem, but with serrated edges tinted with the yellow of dissolution and decay. It hung bravely from a branch some twenty feet above the ground. It is the last one, said Johnsey. I thought it would surely fall during the night. I heard the wind. It will fall today, and I shall die at the same time. Dear, dear, said Sue, leaning her warm face down to the pillow. Think of me if you won't think of yourself. What would I do? But Johnsey did not answer. The lonesomest thing in the, all the world is a soul when it is making ready to go on its mysterious far journey. The fancy seemed to possess her more strongly as one by one the ties that bound her to friendship and to earth were loosed. The day wore away and even through the twilight they could see the lone ivy leaf clinging to its stem against the wall. And then with the coming of the night, the north wind was again down from the low Dutch eaves. When it was light enough, John C., the merciless, commanded that the shade be raised. The ivy leaf was still there. John C. lay for a long time looking at it, and then she called to Sue, who was steering her chicken broth over the gas stove. I've been a bad girl, Sudi, said John C. Something has made that last leaf stay there to show me how wicked I was. It is a sin to want to die. You may bring me a little broth now and some milk with a little port in it. And no, bring me a hand mirror first and then pack some pillows about me and I will sit up and watch you cook. An hour later, she said, Sudi, someday I hope to paint the Bay of Naples. The doctor came in the afternoon and Sue had an excuse to go into the hallway as he left. Even chances, said the doctor, taking Sue's thin shaking hand in his. With good nursing, you will win. And now I must see another case I have downstairs. Berman, his name is. Some kind of artist, I believe. Pneumonia too. He is an old weak man and the attack is acute. There is no hope for him. But he goes to the hospital today to be made more comfortable. The next day, the doctor said to Sue, She's out of danger. You have won. Nutrition and care now, that's all. And that afternoon, Sue came to the bed where John C. lay, contentedly knitting a very blue and very useless woolen shoulder scarf, and put one arm around her, pillows and all. I have something to tell you, white mouse, she said. Mr. Berman died of pneumonia today in the hospital. He was ill only two days. The janitor found him on the morning of the first day in his room downstairs, helpless with pain. His shoes and clothing were wet through an icy cold. They couldn't imagine where he had been on such a dreadful night. And then they found a lantern still lighted 
and a ladder that had been dragged from its place and some scattered brushes and a palette with green and yellow colors mixed on it. And look out the window, dear, at the last ivy leaf on the wall. Didn't you wonder why it never fluttered or moved when the wind blew? Ah, darling, it's Berman's masterpiece. He painted it there the night the last leaf fell.